Hello, everyone. And thank you so much for staying for the Q&A. And I'd like to introduce the director of Montage of Hack, Brett Morgan. Thank you. So thank you so much for coming to the Dokovi Festival. And thank you for letting us spend time with Kurt. Because after seeing this film, I have to say that after years of listening to, to Nirvana, that's like the first time that I actually felt like I'm getting to know him. You know, yeah. you probably get this a lot. No, I mean, that was the experience I had, you know, and, and, and particularly became crystallized after, um, after I collected everything from the storage facility. And at the same time we were doing that, we were collecting all the media that, that had been disseminated during Kurt's time with Nirvana. And when you compared the images that had been public, you know, th through MTV or wherever during his lifetime to all of the other stuff, it was, it was, you know, it's just, it felt like there was this whole other side that needed to be sort of exposed and revealed, you know, the, the romanticism and the humor and, and, and the joy, you know, and there was a lot of joy because I don't think in public we saw Kurt, um, la la you, you know, I, I don't recall hearing him laugh all that much and the smiles were rare. Maybe ironic laughs like yeah, uh, during interviews. Yeah, exactly. But you know, joy is not quite the, the emotion I would describe when thinking about this film. Yeah. <laughs> I, you know, I find there to be moments of total joy. Like I love the stuff at Tracy's house when he's um, just creating. You know, I feel like that's really joyful. And I find there, there's, there's parts where he's with Courtney where they seem so simpatico that you know, brings like, you know, it's just, it, there was a feeling in assembling the film when you would arrive at those places where it just felt good, you know, to get away from some of the angst and to like be in a pocket of, you know, or the stuff with Francis, I like, you know, just as of assembling it, it you know, you know, I, I, would have even liked if there was more moments of levity that we could have mined. Yeah. So before going into that, uh, let's start at the beginning. What started this movie? Um, well, it started in 2007. Uh, Courtney Love approached me. She had seen the movie I did called The Kid Stays in the Picture. And, um, and she liked the way that I worked with uh, photo animation. And she said, you know, Kurt, we have this, you know, everyone knows Kurt as the lead singer of Nirvana, but I have this storage facility full of art. And that began a four or five year journey um, to get all the rights assembled because she only had name and likeness and there were lots of other parties and we needed everyone to basically sign off. And then while that was all taking place, her daughter came of age and that kind of changed the whole narrative because at that point, um, it was always clear from the beginning there was never any issue with Courtney about the fact she couldn't have any control of the film, that for many obvious reasons, mainly being a subject of the film. Um, but Francis was a little different, and, and, um, and at the time we started, we were ready to start making the film. Francis had, this was the first project she sort of took I don't know, control or, what, you know, sort it's of, exec yeah, producer, sort right? of put her name on related to the, to the, to the estate. And, um, and when I met with her, she, the one thing she said is whatever you do, make the film honest, you know, like just keep it real. That's the best way we could pay tribute to Kurt mm -hmm. because a lot of these type of movies are, you know, when they're sanctioned by the family, it's usually not the directive to make it as honest as possible. Mm -hmm. So this was a really courageous act, I think, on on the family's part to to allow the film to, you know, we weren't trying to, you know, the, the idea of making it honest wasn't trying to, to, to tear Kurt down at all or, you know, we just weren't trying to put him on a pedestal. It was more trying to just sort of see him for what was there and allow him to express his experience wherever we could. Through his, through his heart. And to see him beyond the myth. Yeah, I mean, but the thing is, if what I unearthed was in concert with the myth, then it would have been the myth. Mm -hmm. You know, like, it, it, the idea wasn't to go in and shatter the myth. I don't know what we were trying to There's shatter. nothing to shatter. It was whatever, whatever we found was what the film was going to be. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Yeah. So, um, you know, to me, it was more about the experience of Kurt. And that was the thing that was... Um, you know, I think worth 
presenting that there are all these different sides of him and all these different ways he can express himself and that I think were equally as inspiring. And, and you know, he's not Picasso. It's not like he's the greatest <laughs> artist in the world, but I, part of it to me is what makes it great is it's so relatable and it feels like your own notebook, you know? And, yeah. um, but the passion, I think that the, the thing that made Nirvana so great, he does bring to all the other art forms. You know, it's the passion and the humor and the angst and all these emotions that, that sort of, of his experience in life that come through in the audio collages and all yeah, the other so, stuff. So let's talk about a, a little bit about all of those different art forms. How does it look like to get into this storage facility that Courtney Loves give you access to? You know, like how I kind of imagine it like the sliver video. Do you know this? Do you know this video? The Nirvana <laughs> video, sliver video? Yeah, no, no, it's, it's not like that a romantic. Tiny, a, a tiny <laughs> room, all messed up, tons of garbage and no, different shit, you no, know? <laughs> no, that would, uh, no, it's how like an innocuous like? storage unit, you know, like the, <laughs> where you, just like any other one. Mm -hmm. That was, um, that, you know, was, uh, we tried to get through as, 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 you know, wasn't the place you want to spend a lot of time. Okay. Yeah. Do doc want to document? I mean, I really got to get intimate with the stuff once we had it all documented and, and brought back to our facility where I could really sit with it mm -hmm. and experience so it. So it was extremely yeah. depressing. No, it's just you know, it's like a storage unit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, less romantic. I get than asked I about what it looks like a lot, and it's like I had the same thing, like thinking maybe it would be like Citizen Kane or Raiders yeah, of the Lost Ark, obviously. and be this. Because Endless, you get this amazing image. Yeah, but it's it's a st <laughs> it's George. <laughs> it's, yeah, not, it's not okay. like Madame Tussauds or anything. So that yeah. mystery is also solved. Yeah, it's not okay. yeah. Uh so what did you uh see when you you know you went through all the stuff? Did you saw like a specific item that got your attention, that sparked your imagination? I think everything was like a revelation, you know? Every 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 little piece, the way I like to describe it is like uh, you open a box and then there's a, a word and you open up another box and there's another word and soon you have a sentence and, and the script is coming together. Mm -hmm. So every piece added some other element to the to the equation. I would say the one thing is going back to something I said earlier, is it wasn't like I was going in there with a, a plan of here's the story of the film and let's find art that supports that. It was, let's look at all the art and the journals and see what story kind of, what narrative sort of mm -hmm. comes to the surface. But one of the things you did find was the montage of her cassette. And yeah, what, was, what, what was about that that made it the blueprint for Yeah, the well that was the real find, was I was told by Courtney and Francis at the, the storage facility there would be um, the, the, the guitars and, and artifacts, but no one mentioned that there was gonna be audio and there was a box and I opened it up and there was 107 cassettes in it that had over 200 hours of unheard audio. So the, the sound design you heard and the score you heard, as I mentioned before, the film was just a, a tiny part of that. Um, and so that opened up a, a whole world. Even the, sc the stuff that you hear, like when Kurt's doing the letter to Francis in the film, the gentle guitar stuff, I mean, that, you know, that was just a small sample of the stuff we found and that's like a different side of Kurt than y y we really ever heard. So everything, was sort of a, a reveal, and then there was this mixtape he did called um, Montage of Heck, which I had no idea to see this thing that says Montage of Heck, and it was this crazy mashup, and if you're over the age of 40 and you remember, like, we used to, instead of sending, writing emails to our girlfriends, we'd make mixtapes. I don't know if people still do that, but yeah. they take a lot, and like, and the more you love someone, the longer you would spend work mm -hmm. making it, and... Kurt just made this mixtape with like, it was like with a lot of love, you know, it was like very complicated mashup of like horror films and sci-fi films and the Beatles and Simon and Garfunkel and Black Flag and all this sh stuff that was very singular to Kurt. Mm -hmm. And it just felt like this portal into his mind and sort of felt like the blueprint for the film was sort of exposed. And how did that affect the sound design for the film? Um, well, that, that was, you know, from the first thing you're hearing in the film, like as the, soon as the credits come on and you're hearing those hello oh, testing one two three. I mean it was not only that were those sound effects coming from Kurt but the way we panned them around the room mm -hmm. you know Kurt's not panning those that's me in the mix panning those but that's all taken from his guide if you will mm -hmm. you know how he would toy with stuff and it's so that was adopting his language that was like the the challenge one of the big challenges of the film for all the all of us who worked on it was sort of learning how to sort of um, work in his sort of vernacular. 
And it's also an invitation, right? Because in the beginning of the film, he invites us to listen to him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, he's sort of doing that through all of his music, though, you know? <laughs> That's true. Yeah. Okay, so um, we, sp we talked about sound, and there's a thing you do that in every place you go where the film is being screened, you live, uh, live mix it, is that what I said? You live mix it, you just, you know, you pay attention to the volume yeah. of the, yeah. yeah so do you do that with all your films? Uh, yeah, no, th this one's in particular is a little sensitive because I feel like y I want the audience to experience it like they were at a concert when we're in the concert scenes. And so you shouldn't be able to turn to the person next to you and say like, hey, what do you think? Like, you shouldn't be able to hear. And I know that I lose like 5% of the audience or something, but I, and I, I don't want to seem like I'm disrespecting anyone, but it, it does seem to be a sacrifice. That you were willing to make. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, just because it's a it's a movie about Nirvana, you know, mm -hmm. and if you went to a Nirvana show, it's it's hard to hear. <laughs> so, I, you know, and I feel like that's the beauty of music, f seeing music films in a cinema is you could take advantage of these awesome speakers because my speakers at home are like built in the wall and they're like that big and there's one, <laughs> you know. It's like so, I just like being able to hear music. Loud. loud yeah i mean this you know if it was like elton john i don't think i'd want it to be <laughs> so loud i like listening to elton john loud although i was sensitive i kept turning to the person next to me going is it too loud i feel like it's too loud tonight i never think that it's too i actually had them turn it down during the movie yeah did it seem too loud it was oh, it was too loud yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, well, it's like you're at a concert, right? It's like you go home from a concert and your ears are ringing. It's, it's Kurt, you know? It's like, no, I'm, I got, I, my, the sound mixer on this film is a, is a, is a veteran he did. He, I think he won the Oscar for Schindler's List, and wow. he's like an um, older generation Hollywood guy, and, and we would talk about it a lot, and I would say, you know, at one point he would say, man, it's an assault, and I was like, exactly, it's, that's what the music is, it's, you know, at times it's gentle, and at times it's an assault. Yeah, that sums it up. Someone <laughs> came up to me the other night, the other, the other night at the beach was crazy, I was getting, people were running up, turn it down! <laughs> You're ruining the movie! I'm like, but this is what it's supposed to sound like. This is my movie. <laughs> well, it worked. No, 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 it worked. I, I, not for this gentleman. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I want to uh, ask you about the animation because I know it was very important for Courtney. And I was wondering what was the process of deciding which parts of the narrative will be animated and which parts are not going to be animated? Um, the... Um, what parts were going to be animated? What parts weren't? Uh, there was no rule of thumb. There's where, yeah, of where things needed to be animated. They, like you know, the first time you see the real animation, of the film is when Kurt, um, his stepmother, just said, you know, I don't know what it would be like to be rejected by your whole family, and then it's like call and response, you know, and then it's you know, this is what it feels like to be rejected by your family. Smash cuts, Sendless Apprentice, and Kurt's art, which is now you know, spooky and houses burning and whatever. You know, so that just, it, you, the, you know, it's a movie, so it felt like it needed to come to life. And, mm -hmm. you know, as opposed to just being a flat document and looking at it and being like, look, there's a representation of what a feeling might feel like. <laughs> okay, so one of the most um, touching parts of the film, in my opinion, are the parts uh, with uh, Tracy, Kurt's uh, first girlfriend. And I was wondering how difficult was it? That's because you're not married and you don't have kids. How you, do you, you know? No, no, I, well, no, uh, that's true. <laughs> no, but I, I, I'm just be, because I find them touching stuff, the Francis stuff. But go ahead, Tracy really? stuff. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So I don't know. I just find it touching because. First of all, I've never seen her doing an interview. I've never heard her of her. I didn't know anything about her, so it was like a whole new concept uh, and a, a whole another side of Kurt. You yeah, know? she. That was one of those moments where I was like, "Oh, thank God!" <laughs> like he's, he's, he's a new got. Oh, I was. Uh, I mean, you could see clearly what I felt about it. By the way, the her first scene comes in with the music swelling and those letters that say "Kiss yeah. Kurt," and it was like, oh, and thank love, God! Love. Oh, this, it was so nice to know that there was that nurturing. 
mm-hmm. you know, that, that he had. And, and she, to this day, you know, like if you asked me, if you interviewed me about my girlfriend from when I was 21, I, I don't, I honestly, like, I don't even know who it is. I, and it wasn't, <laughs> I, I don't mean because I was a tramp. I just like, it would be a because five minute. Because you're that old. And then it would be a five minute interview. <laughs> and, and you can, she really, like all the people in the film who are interviewed, you could see are very touched still. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and I and I found her I found her emotion to be very genuine and and touching, you know, especially given how many years have gone gone by. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you spent the last eight years of your life uh, immersed in the world of Kurt Cobain, and how is it like to finally, after the film is done, to let go? Um, well, it's a gradual thing, so it's just starting. I think you know. But, um, yeah, it, you know, I felt like over the last uh, couple years, you know, I felt closer to Kurt than anyone else out of my family, you know, because, it, my, you know, um, well, I was spending all, all day with these very pure expressions of him, you know, and, 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 you know, one of the things Chris Novoselic said to me is he, Kurt never talked about his problems. And Chris, Chris didn't know that Kurt had any childhood problems, so he heard him mention it to the press. And that makes sense because when you're in your early 20s and you're a teenager and you're drinking beer with your friends, you're not like, man, did I ever tell you I'm really threatened by ridicule? I mean, it's just not something that sort of goes down. And to this day, most of my male friends, when we hang out, we're not like being that vulnerable with each other. And, and there's all this, anyway, so it was just very intimate, you know? And so it was really, it was real honor, like, and like total privilege to have had that time. Because Court is such a uh, personal figure for many people, like for me, uh, coming out of the film in the Tel Aviv port earlier this week, I was shocked to discover that like 4,000 people uh, were there because for me Nirvana is like my personal thing, my personal band, a band that was everything for me when I was 15. So how do people react to the, f- to the film with the subject being so holy? I, I, I mean, th- 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 it's late on a Friday night, and I guess there's a lot of people <laughs> sitting here, so I don't, you know, it, I think it's, it, people have, a, it's, it's been, I think uh, it's nice to spend time with Kurt, you know, as you sort of said at the beginning, and mm-hmm. I think that's kind of the, the sort of message of the film, really, it's just, it's nice to spend a couple more hours with him, that I think a lot of us never thought we'd have. So you want to take some uh, questions from the audience? Sure, if anyone's, I uh, know it's late, so... Yeah, she asked. Um, uh, she was asking about uh, uh, one of Kurt's girlfriends, um, Toby Bell. Couple things. One, yeah, couple things. A, there's f- almost no footage of Kurt and Toby like in existence, which makes it very difficult to put in. It was a very short period of time, and it just would have been another. You know, you have to make these sort of decisions in a film that you can't get everything in there, and it felt like it would have been a double beat with Tracy in a way. Like I felt like Tracy got me to the next place. And that's just reality. That's why, like, you know, if you're interested in the subject, people should, I, I encourage people to go read the books that I, you know, you know what I, no, I know you have. But, you know, that's the thing it is when you make these movies is you have to decide, are you going to get all the facts or all the big beats of the story in, or are you going to just f- find a thread and stick with it? And no, no, thank you, thank you. No, I'm just, uh, but, but it's, it's a thing, like, where, you know, it, 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 you know there's always, like, or where's Dave Grohl, or... You know, like, and, and the thing is, like, if I just didn't want to put that many people in the film. I wanted it to be very intimate. And, and, and so, of course, that ruffles feathers or, uh, you know, you leave something out or you don't mention some album or something. But um, I think that's the, you have to be really, uh, when you do these films, uh, try to use a lot of restraint to not, you know, to keep on track. Keep on keeping on. He is asking about, um, um, in, in essence, was there stuff that I was worried about using um, because this stuff is so intimate. You know, um, uh, Francis was the arbiter, not me, and I feel like that decision really goes to next of kin, and that's his daughter in this case. And um, I, I think, uh, um, you know, that, and it was, it was rare to be in the situation I was in where you can do whatever you want to do, and... Um, so, I mean, look, like, for example, the haircutting scene, I don't like looking at that scene. It's a horror show. You know, it's a horrible, horrible, horrible thing to look at. You know, but it serves a purpose. And, 
I think at the end of the day, this film really helped bring Francis and Kurt closer together. And I think at the end of the day, that overrides a lot. I think that, that really that's a, you know something that wasn't going to happen, you know. And I think some of like that scene in particular was an important scene for her, you know, and understanding and and coming to a, a, a good place. So. I think that, you know, Kurt was about honesty. And I think that, um, you know, and I, I think stylistically it was really important that I, I wanted to make a film that if he was 15 years old and he was watching a film on like, a, you know, some musician or whatever, or some kid, he would stylistically like the movie, he would, this movie. And, you know, that was important that it had some, you know, sort of an integrity artistically, creatively. Um, but I did, there was nothing that really I backed down from. To go back to your thing, there, there was nothing that where I uh, there there were there were things maybe gossipy shit that I wouldn't want to use anyways. Stuff he would say about people that just when there's no reason to go there, you know. But um, yeah, thanks. Thank you, thank you. Anyone else? Yeah. Uh, she, she was asking about the death and saying that she'd seen a lot, correct me if I'm summing this up, right, that you'd seen a lot of films and they deal with the death and you liked the fact it didn't deal with the death and you wanted to know. Yeah. Um, you know, first of all, f one, it's been, other people can make whole movies about it. That's fine. You know, that's, the, uh, you know, for, for me, it wasn't ever a question, really. And, um, I sort of feel like that that all the answers I was ever going to get ended in Rome, for the most part, for the story that I was presenting, and so it just felt that was where the story needed to end. And and also after where did you sleep? There was nowhere else for me to to go, and um, I just I think it just gets and th there was no creation, you know. It's like I I, I don't even it would just be a bunch of people telling the story at that point, and I just didn't want to. But I will say this, that when Frances saw the film, the first thing she said when it was over, is she said, you know what my favorite part of the film is? And I said, what? And she said, the end. And I said, which part? And she goes, the way it cuts to black. You know, and I thought that that was pretty, pretty powerful. Yeah. Yeah. After she said that, I did extend the black hole <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> it's like, well, if it's working, we might as well just... Try to stretch it out a little bit. Thank you all so much. You've been an amazing audience. Really appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. Thank uh, you so much, Brett. Well, uh, thank you. Yeah.